Okay, so we can get started. Uh, so last time we talked about uh, joint CDF and joint PDF, right? So for joint CDF, for both of these CD, joint CDF and joint PDF, we can marginalize them along one uh, over one variable. So after marginalization, we get a CDF and PDF of a single random variable. Okay. And, uh, and essentially marginalization corresponds to taking integration of the joint CDF uh, or PDF over one direction, either the X or Y, y axis. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, statistical independence of random variables. Since we have, we now are considering two or more random variables. Right? So a natural idea is to, uh, is to study whether they are independent or not independent. Now in the, at the beginning, when we talk about events in the probability theory, we defined independence of events as follows, right? We have a, the probability of, of a joint event if they can be decomposed into a product of the probability of these individual events, then we say these two events are independent. Now we can leverage this idea to define independence of random variables. Now we say two random variables are statistically independent if these two events uh, are independent for all thresholds, small x and small y. Okay. And these two events are basically uh, the, the event that the random variable x is less than or equal to small x and the random variable y is less than or equal to small y. So basically this probability of this joint event, it can be decomposed. And if we rewrite, if we rewrite this equation using uh, the, the CDF notation, so we can see that the left-hand side is basically the joint CDF and the right-hand side is the product of the individual CDF, right? So basically independent random variables will have these independent CDFs. So the joint CDF can be easily uh, decomposed into their marginalized CDFs. Now, if we have, uh, if these two random variables have their PDFs, then uh, <clears throat> for these independent random variables, their joint PDF can also be decomposed into the product of their individual uh, PDFs. Okay, so it's a, this is a very natural definition of independence of of two random variables, and we can generalize this definition to n random variables right? simply by decomposing the joint CDF of n random variables into the product of the CDF of all these individual random variables. This is a natural idea. Now, for example, we can, we can consider a bunch of independent Gaussian random variables. Right? X1, Xn, they are Gaussian random variables with mu and sigma, a variance sigma square. And they are independent with each other. They are mutually independent, actually. So let, let's say this, they are mutually independent. Uh, then we can derive the uh, joint density function. Now by the independence property, right? The joint PDF is basically the product of all the individual PDFs. And for each individual, for the individual PDF of each random variable XI, we are given that it is a Gaussian distribution, okay? So we write this, the Gaussian PDF into this formula. So this is the Gaussian PDF uh, for this random variable xi. Okay. So it's a product over all these Gaussian individual Gaussian PDFs, and uh, simplify that because this is a product over i. 
so we can we can put it we can absorb this uh, product into this exponential so so in the end we will have summation in this exponent instead of a product so this is the joint joint pdf of all these independent Gaussian random variables and you can see that it, it is also looks uh, looks like a Gaussian Gaussian PDF. And in the next lecture, next few lectures, we will define this uh, high dimensional Gaussian random vector. So this is basically the PDF function of this Gaussian uh, random Gaussian vector in the high dimensional space. So this is the independence of, of a very uh, very natural generalization of independence of events to the independence of random variables. And next is a very uh, important part where we are going to talk about functions of two random variables and discuss how to calculate the PDF and CDF. Now remember that, um, so here's the setup. In the previous lectures, we talk about uh, functions of random variables, right? We have a function G applied to a realization of the random variable. And we call this a new random variable, U. Now we are going to ask how, given the PDF or CDF of X, how can we calculate the PDF or CDF of this new random variable, U? Now we have uh, developed some some approaches to calculate those uh, PDF and CDFs. Now here we're going to look at a more, uh, more general setup setting. Well, we are looking at a pair of random variables, X and Y. So we are given some basic information of this pair of random variables. And then we want to look at a function U, uh, a new random variable U, that is the function of these two random variables. And maybe there's another uh, random variable V, which is another function applied to these two random variables. So we have a pair of functions here. And also a pair of new random variables. Each random variable is a function of these two random variables. Now, the questions of interest are, for example, given if we are given the CDF and the PDF of X and Y, and also given this function G, how can we calculate the PDF and CDF of this, func this random variable U? Right. So this is a very basic, uh, basic idea. So this generalizes the previous, our previous discussion where this U is a function of a single random variable. So now we have two random variables and these two random variables may be, may or may not be independent, right? So how can we address that? And also once we have this uh, PDF of this U, how can we calculate this expectation? So what, if the first question can be answered, this, the second question should be uh, very easy. We just take following the, Expect definition of expectation. Now the third question is that, suppose you have another random variable V that is also a fu another function of these two random variables, right? But these two functions may in general may be very different, this G and H. But in general, both U and V, these two random variables are depending on these two random variables, uh, these two random variables, X and Y. Right? So intuitively, this U and V, they may have some correlations because both of them depends on the same pair of random variables through a certain functions. Therefore, the natural question is, what is how can we compute the joint PDF and the CDF of these two new random variables, U and V? Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at the first question. Um, by looking at some examples. Okay. Now, the first question is that uh, given, 
consider this function of two random variables and consider this random variable u. Now, given some information of uh, x and y, how can we compute the PDF and CDF of this random variable u? Now, let's consider this practical example. Well, we, uh, this is a very simple example where we set u as x plus y, the addition of two random variables. It's prob probably the simplest uh, function of two, two, two variables. Yeah. So we want to find, find out the PDF of this random variable in terms of the joint PDF of x and y. But suppose we know the joint PDF of x and y. <clears throat> because the joint PDF of uh, joint PDF gives everything, every information about uh, this pair of random variables. So we want to express the PDF of u in terms of the joint PDF. So this is the first case. And in the second case, if x and y are independent, we want to further express this PDF in terms of the marginal PDFs. But I think the second one, let, let's look at the first one first. The second one should be a very straightforward extension of the first one. So suppose we are given this joint PDF. Now let's look at uh, the PDF of this U. <clears throat> so to do that, we can first consider uh, deriving the CDF function of random variable U because CDF is the most fundamental uh, function associated with a random variable. So let's look at F, capital F, U, and small u, which is the CDF of U evaluated at small u. By definition, it corresponds to the probability that uh, the random variable U is smaller than or equal to U. But now the random variable U is defined as the addition of these two random variables. So we plug that into this uh, probability. So it's probability of x plus y less than uh, equal to u. And this inequality defines or corresponds to a, a certain region in the two dimensional space, right? So we can visualize this area in the two dimensional space. So, so let's look at this figure. So basically we draw this X and Y axis so that each axis represents the realization of the random variable X and Y. Now this event, which is described by this inequality corresponds to the cases, all the cases where the realization of X and Y adding together is smaller than or equal to a number small u, right? And this, re this is a linear region. Uh, a half half uh, hyperplane in this two dimensional space. So we can draw, we can first draw this line. This is a line, uh, this line corresponds to this uh, equation, x plus y equals to u, okay? Well, u is a fixed given, uh, given number. So th basically this line will cross these two axes at the point u. According, according to this uh, line equation. <clears throat> now we are looking at the region where x plus y should be less than or equal to u. So this corresponds to the sh uh, sh uh, shaded region that is below this line equation, below this line. So this is the area that we are looking at uh, that corresponds to this event. Therefore, we need to compute the probability uh, of, of this event, which is basically accumulating all the joint PDFs, right? Accumulating all the joint PDF between X and Y over this shaded area. Right? So that's why we have this double in, uh, integration. <clears throat> so, so this double integration is basically accumulating the joint PDF between X and Y and, and over this, shaded area, okay? And integrating over this shaded area is given, is specified by this double integration. And this double integration, uh, you can do it either vertically or horizontally, uh, depending on your preference. Also depending, it's actually depending on the shape of this region. In this case, 
Either way, it would be convenient. And in some cases, one would be simpler than the other. So in this, in this formula, we are actually, so in the outer uh, integration, we are integrating over X, right? And we can say that this shaded area will expand over the entire X axis. So this X should be to uh, range from net infinity to cos infinity. Now, once we fix an X, and we get into the inner integration. Once we fix an x, we will need to integrate or over this vertical vertical line. And apparently, this vertical line would be would intersect with this shaded region at this point. So this is like the upper bound that we can integrate over the y-axis. Right? Therefore, in the inner integration, if we integrate over y-axis, it should start from net infinity and goes up, up to this point. Well, the y-coordinate according to this line equation is u minus x. Because this coordinate is on this line. So x plus y equals to u. Well, y, the y-coordinate is basically u minus x. So that's why here the upper limit for this integration over y is u minus x is this the y coordinate of this intersection point <clears throat> right so this is a double integration that we are looking at and once we have that once we have this uh the pdf this is so this is a cdf cdf function of u no. If we if we know the specific formula for this joint CDF, a joint PDF, we can just evaluate this double integration and get the exact analytical form of this CDF. Now, once we have that, we can just take derivative, assuming it's differentiable, just take derivative to get the PDF function. And for this double integration, taking derivative over U. Now the outer integration does not depend on u, it only depends on x. It is in it is the inner integration where the u is involved in this upper limit, right? So we just need to take derivative with, with regard to the inner integration. And the inner integration taking derivative over u according to the derivative rule uh, gives this join join the PDF evaluated at x and u minus x. Right. So the conclusion is that the PDF of u of this x plus y random variable is given in this way. Right. It is integrating the joint PDF of x and y in this way. <clears throat> So this is the first question of okay, ex express PDF of U in terms of uh, joint PDF of X and Y. Now the second question further assumes that X and Y are independent random variables. So we can further decompose this joint PDF in terms of their marginal PDFs. Right? So if they are independent, then according to this one, we can further decompose F, X, Y into the product of these two individual PDFs, marginal PDFs. Right, so it's fx evaluate, evaluated at x times fy evaluated at u minus x. And if you are familiar with signal and systems in 3500, you probably will notice that this one is exactly the definition of convolution between these two functions or signals. Right? If you view the PDF as a signal, this is, this is exactly the convolution operator between two signals. Right? So for this random variable, if X and Y are independent, then the PDF is essentially given by the convolution of these two marginal PDFs.
Right, so this is a conclusion that we can we can have, and this is an example, a very specific example. Uh, follow this uh, problem. So we are still looking at this random variable. Well, x and y are independent uh, random variables, and also we are given specifically given that the PDF of x is a uniform distribution over this interval, whereas the PDF of y is also uniform over this interval. Right? So we call this IID, which means identically, uh, which, which, which means independently and identically distributed, right? because x and y, they are, first of all, independent. And second of all, uh, they have the identical PDF. <clears throat> So we, we usually refer to such a case as IID. And according to uh, our conclusion here, uh, with this two, with this setup, the PDF of U is given by the convolution of these two marginal PDFs. And we know the convolution of these two rectangle signals is essentially a triangular signal. Okay. Yeah, so the question is why here the range of y is from negative infinity to. Sorry, it should be, no, it should be the range of x that ranges from negative infinity. It's because we are first in this double integration, right? We are integrating vertically. So this, this, all these vertical lines will move from left to right. So over X, it, it goes from net infinity to positive infinity because you, you can find all these vertical lines everywhere spanning over it, spanning the entire X axis. Yeah. But over Y, this vertical line will be truncated by this intersection point, right? So that's why we have upper limit. <clears throat> Yeah. But if you do it horizontally, it's the other way. But they are the same. Okay. So let's look at some other examples okay, of functions of two random variables. And this is a function of two random variables. Well, the random variable Z is defined as the maximum of these two. Okay. So take the maximum of these two of the realizations of these two random variables and assign that to the random variable Z. Okay, if this is, def uh, <clears throat> if Z is defined in this way, find the CDF of Z in terms of the joint CDF. <clears throat> and this is a not a, not an easy problem because this function is not, D differentiable is not uh, <clears throat> continuous, you see, because sometimes x is bigger than y. So in that case, z is actually equals to x, right? But sometimes x is less than y. In that case, z is equals to y. So you have this <clears throat> uncertainty in this uh, in this equation. So let's look at uh, how to find this CDF. And again, to calculate the CDF, everything. But the only approach, the most fundamental approach is to follow the definition. So we follow this definition, the CDF of Z is the probability that this random variable is less than or equal to Z, where small z is a stretch code. Now this Z is defined as the maximum of this X and Y random variables. So we replace Z by this function. Okay, and this function, defines a region over the two-dimensional space, right? Again, if you draw this x and y axis, this is an equation. This inequality corresponds to a region on this two-dimensional space. And we need to figure out what this region corresponds to. And you can check that this region corresponds to this shaded area. Well, basically, um, <clears throat> let's write it here. So we are looking at max between 
x and y with less than or equal to a number z. Okay, trying to visualize this one. Now think about that. If the maximum of the two is less than or equal to something, right? It, it is already the maximum of the two that is less than or equal to something. So this is equivalent to say that any of them or both of them should be less than or equal to this one. Right. These two are equivalent. If the maximum of these two is already smaller than this one, then, which means any of them should be smaller than that one. And these two line equations will give us this shaded area, right? So this vertical line is, okay, we can draw this here. X less than or equal to Z, suppose Z is here. This corresponds to this, the left-hand side of this vertical line, right? Y smaller than or equal to Z, this corresponds to, uh, suppose Z is here on the Y axis, corresponds to the, to the bottom of this horizontal line. So taking their intersection, we, we have this shaded rectangle area. So this, this is area. So basically uh, this event is equivalent to the joint event of these two. Right, both of them must be less than or equal to Z. And this happened to be the definition of the joint CDF function. Right? So it's the joint CDF evaluated at Z and Z, which is exactly this shaded area. So this is the CDF of Z in terms of the joint CDF of uh, X and Y. Now, if they are further independent, then of course we can further decompose these joints, joint uh, CDF uh, in terms of the product of their marginal CDFs. Right. Now, this example is the kind of the, uh, the complementary case where we are looking at, instead of looking at the max, we look at the mean. Okay. Kind of symmetric, but let's see if there's, if there's a, really some symmetries in this, uh, between these two examples. Now let's look at this W defined as the mean of these two random variables. Now we're, do, we're going to do the same thing, find out the CDF in terms of the joint CDF of X and Y. Okay, so follow the definition, the CDF of W is probability that W less than or equal to a threshold small w. But here we, we need to play a trick uh, where we use the complementary property of probability laws to you know, translate this one into one minus the probability of the uh, complementary event. Yeah, it's one minus probability W is bigger than small w. Now, first of all, this is, uh, this is always true, right? Because they are complementary to each other. But why do we want to translate this uh, inequality into this one, because in this one, we are looking at smaller than or equal to. And uh, this turns out to be a little bit confusing when we analyze the mean function. Right? Now, once we translate it into this, the other way, where we are looking at the inequality W, which is bigger than small W, this inequality will, is much easier to, to analyze uh, when we deal with this mean function. But anyway, for this step, this is a standard, uh, this is a <clears throat> based on the standard property of probability law. Now we can plug in the definition of W. W is basically the mean of these two. Now, that, now think about this inequality. It says that the minimum of these two realizations is bigger than a certain number W, right? If the minimum of the two is bigger than something, then that is equivalent, equivalently to say that any of them should be bigger than that. Right? Otherwise, if anyone is smaller than that, the minimum should be at least smaller than that. So that's why we translate this less than equal to inequality into bigger than, uh, into this another complementary inequality, because this one is easier to analyze. Okay, so this event, is essentially the event that 
both x and y must be bigger than w. So we are looking at one minus probability that x bigger than w, y bigger than w. Right? And this probability part, this term corresponds to this shaded area. Right? Well, x is bigger than w, so it's on top of this horizontal, uh, sorry, it's, it's to the right of this vertical line. Y bigger than W is on top of this, uh, above this uh, horizontal line. So their intersection is this shaded area. So, and we eventually, we need to look at one minus this shaded area. So that essentially corresponds to the rest of the areas. And the rest of areas can be described by these CDF functions. But if we, so basically we are looking at these areas. These shaded areas. And this shaded area, we can <clears throat> understand it as the red area, which is to the left of this vertical line, uh, plus the green area, right, which is to the to the bottom of this uh, horizontal line, green line. But this intersection area is counted twice, so we need to subtract this intersection area. Right. So the red area is essentially, you know, um, here y goes to there's no restriction on y, well as x is restricted to be W. So it cons corresponds to this marginal CDF. Right? Now this green area corresponds to this, uh, this marginal CDF. And finally, we need to subtract the intersection area, which, which is given by the joint CDF at this intersection point, omega and omega. Right? So this is why we have this figure. So you can see that the mean, the mean, uh, the random variable defined by the mean of the these two random variables, uh, is CDF is very different from the max, right? In the max, we have a very relatively simple expression, but in the mean, it's more complicated. Okay. <clears throat> So this is part A. Now following this part A, suppose for these two random variables, X and Y, if we are given that they are exponential random variables and are independent with each other, uh, find out this, the final expression for the uh, CDF of this W. Yeah. So we are given that X is a exponential a random variable. So we know this PDF is given by the exponential lambda distribution. Now y is also the same this has the same distribution, right? And we are we know that they are we are given that they are independent. Okay. So given this information, we can calculate fx, which is the CDF. So taking integration of this one, we can calculate fx. We can also calculate fy, right? The CDF of y. This can be done. Now for the joint CDF, because they are independent. So the joint CDF is given by the product of these two marginal CDFs. So everything can be calculated. <clears throat> now plug in all these uh, CDF functions uh, into this formula, we can get this result. Okay. So it is uh, another exponential. Uh, CDF. So W is also an exponential random variable in this case. Right. So this is the first of, so this discussion, right, tells us in order to find if we are given a function of two random variables, right, <clears throat> 
in order to find the CDF of this U, one approach is to follow the definition of CDF. I follow the definition and then write down the equation, plug in the equation of U in, uh, into this uh, event. But, and this will give us a region in the two dimensional space. Now we just need to accumulate the joint probability densities over this, the corresponding uh, area defined by this inequality, right? So that in the, in the end reduces to either a double integration or in some other cases, it's a little bit, uh, in this case is it's a little bit discontinuous. So you have to analyze that case, depend, uh, case by case. Right, so this approach, all these problems, we have for, for all these problems, we are following the basic approach, starting from the definition of the CDF. So I think this finishes the lecture 16. <clears throat> right, so that, that answers the first question, given a function of two random variables, how can we calculate this CDF? Right. Once we have CDF, we have PDF. Now, the second question is more challenging. Is that, suppose we have, uh, suppose we have two, we now have two random variables, U and V. Both of them are, can be expressed as a function of two random variables, X and Y. Okay. The only difference is that G and H may be different. So U and V, they both depend on X and Y in different ways. Now we want to find the joint PDF of U and V, okay? Because the joint PDF or the joint CDF tells us everything about these two random variables. So we want to find the joint PDF between U and V in terms of the joint PDF of X and Y. <clears throat> so you can view these two equations as a kind of transformation, right? Originally, you have a pair of random variables, X and Y, and then you apply certain transformation, G and H, to transform this pair of random variable into another pair of random variables. So of course, the corresponding joint PDF will also be uh, <clears throat> transformed into another form. Now here, the solution is actually very, very similar to what we have for the, for the single random variable case. Right? In the previous lectures, when we talk about the functions of a single random variable, we have this so-called fundamental theorem. So the fundamental theorem says that Okay, given this equation, I can express the PDF of Y in terms of the PDF of X in this way, in this equation. Okay. Well, we just need to figure out, first of all, find out all the roots of this equation. Right. Suppose we find out many, many roots, X1, X2 up to XK. At each root XK, we compute the derivative of this function g, right? And then we take, we compute the ratio between the PDF of x at this root over the absolute value of this derivative and then sum over all the roots, right? So basically there are two steps. First, solve this equation, get all the roots, and second of all, compute this, uh, evaluate this PDF and the deriv derivative of gradients at these roots and compute this summation, right? two steps. Now in the two dimensional case, now we have two random variables, X and Y instead of one, right? Instead of one X. And we also, this will give us another two random variables instead of one. So everything is doubled. 
So in this case, we have very similar formula, which can be derived in a very similar fashion. Uh, in this one dimensional case, in, previously when we illustrate this idea, we are talking about, we're using very small intervals, right? But in the two dimensional case, so I will not go into all the details here, but intuitively everything is in two dimensional now. So the previous intervals in one dimension becomes small rectangles in two dimension. And these small rectangles after transformation can be transformed into a kind of diamond area. So in the end, we have these standard steps to evaluate this uh, joint PDF. So let's look at this step. <clears throat> so we are given these two equations, right? These two equations will define two random variables, u and v, in terms of x and y. Now, the first step is exactly the same. Now we have two equations, g and h, these two equations, and we have two variables, u and v. Uh, we have two variables, x and y. We can solve this pair of equations for their roots. Right? So we find, we solve this pair of equations to find their solutions. And suppose we have many pairs of roots. X1, Y1 could be uh, one, so the first solution. X2, Y2 is the second solution. Okay. So basically, you solve this pair of equations for X and Y. Right. This is direct generalization of the single random variable case. Right. Now, at each solution, at each root, x, i, y, i, let's say this is the i's solution that you found. At each solution, you do the following. Okay. You need to compute. So the, the final formula is very similar to the to a single random variable case, right? The joint PDF between u and v is given by sum over all the roots well, in each term of the summation, we are looking at here is the joint PDF in the numerator, right? Is the joint PDF evaluated at these roots, this pair of roots, right? And divided by this term, well, this term is also a direct generalization of the absolute value of the derivative in the single random variable case. But now it is a bit more complicated. Now this term, J, X, I, Y, I, is defined as follows. <clears throat> it's defined as the, through such a Jacobian matrix. Okay? So basically, Right. This J, X, I, Y, I is a number. A number given by this formula. Now, how, how is this number computed? It is computed by this one. First of all, you, you evaluate the deriv partial derivative of these functions with regard to X and Y respectively. Because G, both G and X uh, and H involves two random variables now, right? So you can evaluate their partial derivatives with regard to X and Y. And also in the second row, you do, do it for H. Now you evaluate these partial derivatives at at this root, right? So basically you evaluate these partial derivatives at these roots, the i's root for x, i, y, i, right? This will give you four numbers, a, b, c, d, right? Four, four numbers. These numbers are basically partial derivatives evaluated at this root. Okay. Now suppose these are A, B, C, D. Let's 
suppose this is A, B, C, D, four numbers. And then this one is equals to A, D minus C, D. This is the how this Jacobian is computed. But you first compute the partial derivatives at this root, which is basically four numbers, and then you calculate A, D uh, minus C, D. I think there's an absolute value. I need to double check, but there should always be an absolute value uh, here. So, so basically the, the formula looks very, very similar, except that everything is now in two dimensional. Um, so, the, so the roots will be solved by this pair of equations. And we are looking, we are accumulating, summing up these ratios over all these roots. For example, we can, we can let's go over this uh, very simple example. Where U and V are defined by addition and subtraction of the two random variables, X and Y. So we, you can call this as G, X, Y, right, function of, First function of x y, you can call this one h x y. So that later on you can just follow this general formula. Now for the first step is to solve these two equations. Right, you, you write them into a pair of equations. U equals to x plus y, v equals to x minus y. And you realize that these are pair of linear equations, so you have a unique uh, solution. And you fit, and then you can find out, okay, the unique solution is this one. Solution is x, x1, meaning the, the first solution. x1 equals to u plus v plus, uh, over two, y1 is u minus v over two. So this is the only solution for this, uh, for this pair of equations. So, so this makes everything even simpler. Now let's evaluate this uh, joint PD, uh, PDF by this equation. So since we only have one solution, so we only have one term in the summation. So this is the only term that we have. Now to compute this term, we need to compute this, the denominator, which is the Jacobian uh, of this, uh, at this root. Now the Jacobian at this root, right, according to this previous formula, uh, let's follow this one. Now, the first entry is uh, taking derivative of g over x. Now, this was g x y. Taking derivative of this one over x, we we get one, right? This this is constant. We are taking the deri derivative of over x, so we get one. One is a constant, so it doesn't depend on where you how you evaluate this x. So this is one, right? And similarly, taking derivative of G over Y is again one. Taking derivative of V of this H over X is one. Taking derivative of H over Y is negative one. Okay. Now you compute this according to this rule. is a times d minus b times c. So this is negative one minus negative one. So you get negative two, taking absolute value, you get, uh, oh, okay. So this, this, then to clarify, uh, here, we don't have absolute value, but in the, so this is j, J, X, I, Y, I. But in the end, we will take absolute value over J. So in the end, everything should be positive. So negative two will become, after taking absolute value, it becomes, uh, <clears throat> it becomes positive two. And then we can plug in the, uh, the that formula. So FUV joint PDF is basically the joint PDF of XY here, 
the joint PDF of XY evaluated at this root. Now this root is given by these two, right? So you plug them in, divided by the, the, the denominator, which is the absolute value of this Jacobian. So it's absolute value of this negative two, which is two. Right? So this is the expression for the joint PDF of u and v in terms of uh, joint PDF of x and y. So we can see it's the joint PDF of x and y evaluated at, at these points, okay, these points. So once you specify a small u and small v in this joint PDF, I can compute it according to the right-hand side. <clears throat> And uh, here, please ignore about these parts. So basically, I think this formula has, uh, the denominator has two ways to compute it. Right? Either you can compute this Jacobian or you can compute this one. Well, they are taking derivatives with regard to different variables, but let's always re stick with one of them so to, to avoid some confusion. Okay? Just stick with this uh, X and Y one so that you don't, you don't need this part. You don't need this part and you don't need this one. Just compute the roots and evaluate the Jacobian at these roots. Right, so this is a very standard process, but of course, everything is the dimensionality is doubled. So everything will be a little bit more complicated. And this is another very, very good example. Uh, two random variables, X and Y. So actually, so this is, here's the setup. <clears throat> we, let's consider a random point, a point on the X and Y plane, two dimensional plane. Well, the coordinates, two coordinates of this point are random. Okay, so basically this point is, a, if you want to generate a, a random point on this uh, two dimensional plane, usually this is how you, how you generate that. So basically you generate these coordinates one by one randomly, right? This is probably the simplest way. Now here we consider uh, this setup where we generate these two coordinates X, Y according to a Gaussian distribution, right? So you first generate the first coordinate according to this Gaussian distribution, and then the second one. And these two, so in this sense, these two coordinates are random variables, right? Both coordinates follows a Gaussian distribution. They are identically distributed. They follow the, meaning that they follow the same Gaussian distribution. And moreover, they are independent. We assume that, that they are independent. So we call this IID, X and Y IID identical, distributed, independent. Now, now suppose uh, this is a one realization of such a random point. And then again, you can imagine once you uh, draw many, many points in this way, it will span over the entire space and there's a distribution over that. Now we want to, the question is we want to look at what is the distribution of this angle and this distance, right? If, if you consider X and Y as the Cartesian representation of a, of a point in a two-dimensional two space, then this theta and R is another, we call it the polar, the polar form uh, to represent a point in a two-dimensional space. And then um, these two, the angle and the distance to the original point, they are given uh, in this way, right? The distance is given by x squared plus y squared taking square root. The theta is arctangent of y over x. But if you are familiar with the complex numbers, this is how we calculate the magnitude and phase. But in this case, right, this defines two new random variables, but the distance is a new random variable. It is, it is square root of X squared plus Y squared, right? X and Y are random variables. They are randomly generated. 
Now the angle theta is again a, another function of two random variables. And the question is very clear. If I give you the PDF of X and Y and say they are independent, now what is the distribution of this R and theta? What is join the distribution of these two new random variables? But at, at the, <clears throat> this seems to be a complicated problem because uh, in the original form, we are looking at coordinates, but after transformation, we are looking at angle and distance, which is very, very different. But we can systematically address this problem using the, uh, the formula that we just introduced. And so so let's, let's look at this uh, problem. So, so the first one is to solve this pair of equation, which is basically, we are, we're trying to express the coordinates x and y in terms of the distance and the angle. Right? Now, if you are familiar with this, uh, the, the setting of complex numbers, uh, this pair of equation will have will give you this solution. So the x coordinate, intuitively, x coordinate is the distance times cosine theta. It's like projecting this one onto this x axis. Now the length of this on the x axis is r times cosine theta. Okay. So it's r times cosine theta. And y is r times sine theta. Right. This is the only solution. So if you give me the polar form, I can go back and uh, find you this, the, the, the coordinates in the Cartesian form. <clears throat> okay. So we have this solution, unique solution. Now, and, and we only have one solution, right? So we so we can just plug in this that into this formula where we only have one solution. So summation only have one term, and we just need to evaluate evaluate this so called Jacobian term. Right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, in the in this example, I guess evaluating this one. Uh, would be complicated. So in this case, right? so here we have two, <clears throat> we have two ways to compute the Jacobians. One way is to directly compute J, X, Y at these roots. If you can do that, then you can put it on the denominator, right? But if you found this one is not easy to compute, you can compute this one, J I U V, and then one over this one will give you the exact value of this, the same Jacobi. And this GI, let, let me let me be specific here. So this, yeah. So this GI, so we call this as a function of two random two variables r and theta, r times cosine theta. We call this G1 r theta, and we call this G2 r theta. So the other way, uh, Directly computing this one is very complicated. So we can compute uh, following this one. Okay. So taking partial derivatives of these uh, functions over u and v respectively. So that would be reduced to, in this case, taking partial derivatives of these two functions over r and theta. Because they are very, they are relatively simple, right? The linear in R and sine cosine in theta. But here, if we want to do it in x and y, we have the square root and the arctangent, which is much more complicated. But if you follow that formula, you follow here. Okay, again, it's, the definition is the same, except that in each entry, we are taking partial derivatives over different functions of different functions. 
So taking partial derivative of this one over R, we get cosine theta. And over and over theta, we get negative negative sine theta times r, right? For this one, taking partial derivative with regard to r, we get sine theta. And uh, with regard to theta, we get r cosine theta. And then you evaluate this, uh, this, this Jacobian. So it's these two multiplication of these two minus the multiplication of these two, right? And magically, you realize this cosine square plus sine square is one, so you only get R. You only get R here. So in the end, you can derive the joint PDF of R and theta, which is essentially, you know, according to that formula, is the joint CDF, joint PDF of X and Y evaluated at this root, right? This is, this is a root and divided by that denominator term. Well, the denominator term is one over one over R. So it's divided by one over R will give you multiplied by R. So it's R times the joint PDF of X and Y in this one. And we know that X and Y are Gaussians, right? X and Y are IID Gaussians. So we know, we know, they are, we know the exact form of the Gaussian PDF, okay? And moreover, they are independent. So this is basically a product of two Gaussians at these two points. So you 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 write it you write it write it out. It's the product of these two Gaussians, right? This is the first Gaussian. Well, we are looking at R cosine theta. and multiply by another Gaussian. Well, we're looking at R sine theta. Okay, now you simplify that. These two can, we can get rid of the square root. These two can be combined, exponential can be combined. So you end up with this term. And you can further simplify because sine square plus cosine square is one. So you can get rid of theta actually. So we only have this term. So this is the final expression for the joint distribution between R and theta. Right? And you can see that this is, this joint distribution actually does not involve theta. but does not involve theta, only involves R. Now, how to understand this one? Now, first of all, we can, for this example, we can easily see that the range for these two random variables, right? Because R is the distance. So this one should be bigger than or equal to zero. Theta is the angle. So it should be always between zero to two pi. Right? So these are the, uh, the domain, the restriction on this, uh, to variables. But if you look at the final expression, it actually implicitly involves theta. Just because over theta, it is uniformly distributed. So basically, if you randomly generate a point according to uh, the, if you randomly generate the coordinates of the point using Gaussian distribution, you can imagine that this point could be anywhere around the space. So this angle should be, we can, so this, this point will take, will correspond to an angle that is equally likely between zero, zero to two pi. Right? Could be here, could be here. It is uniform over the angle. So this one in this, if you decompose this joint C, uh, PDF into, you, you re rearrange these terms, right? Rewrite it as the product of one over two pi times the other terms. This one over two pi actually corresponds to the distribution of theta. The theta is between two, zero to two pi. This one over two pi means that this is actually F theta theta. 
actually meaning that the distribution of the angle is uniform between over zero to two pi. <clears throat> well, as the distribution of the distance, right? If you randomly draw a point according to in this way, the distribution of the distance to the original point takes such a form. We call this Rayleigh distribution. So it's like an exponentially, uh, it is more likely to, to, to sort of the realization of this random point is more likely to be close to the original point. Because if R, if the distance keeps increasing, this one decays very fast. So the density will be converged to zero, right? So this density will concentrate around small values of distance. So this is actually, so this formula actually tells us that uh, the joint PDF is a product of the marginal PDFs, which means these two parameters, R and theta, they are independent. Uh, these two random variables, they are <coughs> uh, independent. So the distance and angle are independent. If you draw the point, if you draw the random point in this way, this is fully decomposable. But of course, if you modify this setting, say X and Y, they are not independent anymore, or they are following different Gaussian distributions with different parameters, then everything will be different. But I think you can follow the same approach. Uh, but then the result will be, could be much more complicated in general, but this approach still applies. Right. So this is a, another example uh, of uh, finding the joint PDFs of two random variables. And let's do one last example so that you know how to do the homework. So we have two IID random variables. Both of them follow the exponential lambda distribution. So therefore we know there are marginal PDFs given by exponential lambda, and we know they are independent. So we actually know they are joint PDF, right? So it's just product of these two marginal PDFs. So basically we know everything about X and Y. <clears throat> Find the Join the PDF for this transformation. Right? So U equals to addition, V equals to the division of these two. Again, we can, this is a standard setup, so we can just follow the standard two steps. So we can call this GXY, call this HXY. Yeah. And before do that, you can quickly look at the range of U and V because X and Y are exponential lambda. So they take values between zero to infinity. Therefore, U can go to between, between zero to infinity. Right? That's the range for U. Whereas V can also be any, anything between zero and infinity. Right? So U and V, they have, the, they have the same range. And the first step is to solve this pair of equation for x and y. This pair of equation, and uh, if you do a careful calculation, this is the only root that you can find, x and y, in terms of u and v. Okay, solve this equation. And in this case, um, I think here we are is calculating using the uh, Jacobi and U and V, but we can we can do the X and Y one. See, if... we can calculate this Jacobian, which uh, let's go back quickly check the formula. It's right here is partial G over X 
over y uh, and this one. Okay, now we go back to this example where g and h are here. So we just compute g over x is just one, g over y against one, h taking derivative over x is one over y, h take derivative with regard to y is negative x squared over y. Now we evaluated this one at the root x1, y1. I evaluate at root. Now you can calculate this Jacobian. It's this product minus this product. This negative x squared y minus one over y evaluated at x1, y1. Now you can plug in x1, y1, plug in this root into this one. I believe you can get yeah one over that one is one plus three square over u. I believe you can get this one. <clears throat> so this is how you compute Jacobian. Once you have that, you have the joint PDF. Here we only have one root, so we only have one one term in the summation. It's the joint PDF of x y evaluated at this root at this root. Now, divided by that Jacobian term. Right? The Jacobian term is basically the absolute value of this, this thing. So divided by this one, you get u times one plus three squared. And moreover, we are given that the joint PDF of x and y is given by this product of two exponentials, right? because they are exponential random variables <clears throat> and they're independent. Okay, now you have this joint PDF, you plug these two variables into this X and Y and do calculations similar, uh, simplify, simplify these terms. But in the end, everything should be in terms of U and V because we are expressing, we're looking at the joint PDF of U and V. Okay, so in the end, this is what you get. This is what you get. <clears throat> And you can see that this is a another exponential-like distribution. So basically, if you look at the final uh, term, it can be perfectly decomposed into something depending on u and something depending on v. Right? So this means that these two random variables are actually independent. And so that this joint PDF can be fully decomposed. So this is like a the PDF of U, whereas this is PDF of V. I think this is Cauchy's distribution, whereas this is uh, something exponential. <clears throat> right, so this is this is a standard steps. Uh, the last example, which I will not go over, that is very similar. X Y are exponential, and we are looking at these two U and V functions, but in this case. It is even simpler than the previous example, right? They are just linear functions. Whereas here we have some nonlinear functions. So I will not go over this one, but you can follow the derivation and check, check these steps one by one. Yeah. So this is the formula for compute uh, to summarize, this is a formula to compute the join the PDF uh, of these two pair of random variables of this pair of random variables. <clears throat> but this requires that uh, they have we have PDFs, which means that the CDF of this of these random variables are differentiable. But sometimes we do not have differentiability. So in that case, we will need to compute this joint PDF by definition, okay. So when these functions, sometimes when they are not differentiable, 
uh, we have to work on the original definition. For example, for example, let's consider these two random variables. Right, it's defined by mean between these two and, and max between these two. We want to find out the joint PDF of these two random variables in terms of X and Y. Right? So in this case, um, <clears throat> these two are not differentiable, mean and the max functions, not non-differentiable. So we have to work through the definition. So write down the joint PDF, which is probability of this joint event. Now U and V, we have the definition, so we plug them in. So it's a probability that this event intersect with this event. Which means if you visualize this, if you understand this as a uh, inequality on the two dimensional plane, right, these two sets of inequalities corresponds to a certain region on the two dimensional plane. The first inequality is that says that the minimum of the two coordinates must be less than u. Well, if you think about this carefully, this is equivalent to say that uh, the minimum should be less than this, less than a threshold, meaning that either one of them, right? either x is less than that one, or y is less than that one, or both of them are less than that one. So, so this, this inequality corresponds to the union of these two events. Uh, either x or y should be less than this threshold. Well, as the second inequality is the maximum less than this one, right? The maximum less than threshold, meaning that both of them, both X and Y <coughs> should be less than this V. So this is the intersection, a joint event. Well, this is a union event. Okay. Analyze this to inequality carefully. And because these two events in this probability, these two are joint events. So we need to further take intersection okay, between these two events. Okay. So this is the region that we are looking at. And if you visualize that, that corresponds to the, well, X less than U corresponds to the, the left to the left of this vertical line, right? Union with y less than u. Y less than u is the to the to the bottom of this uh, green line. Okay, and then this one. Okay, so so basically you um, you analyze these intersections. I, I think it's, it is better to visualize this one on the two dimensional plane, and. Uh, so I think in the end, it corresponds to uh, this shaded area. I, I think it's, the, uh, it's, it's this shaded area. This one. And this, this shaded area, this one and the vertical line, not vertical line up to here, Mm -hmm. and the uh, horizontal line up to here, vertical line. So the shape looks like, looks like this, right? So it can be written as this one plus this one subtracting the intersection area, right? So that's why we have this one joint joint CDF that corresponds to this red area plus the green area subtract the intersection area. Okay. So this is this is the CDF. And this is the case when u is less than v, so that uh, this the shape looks looks a little bit weird. But if u is bigger than v, 
uh, if you if you do this analysis again, you can realize that the resulting shade uh, the resulting shaded area is very simple. It's, it is just this rectangle uh, type area. So in this case, the joint CDF is given in a simpler form, okay, depending on the positions of these two stretch holes. Yeah. So you, in this case, you have to analyze this uh, case by case. Okay, so this is everything about uh, computing the joint uh, PDF of two random variables. Well, each of them is a function of another two random variables. And I think with this, you should be able to <clears throat> work on homework seven. Okay, and I will, uh, yeah, I will hold office hours in the afternoon so you can discuss the homework problems with me. Okay, see you guys. <laughs>